Good morning, church. Uh, it's so good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here today. It's such a great day to be alive. Anybody glad that Jesus is here? Anybody? Oh, I need some time. I need some time with Jesus. Absolutely. We're so honored that you're here today. So glad to have Daniel leading us today as Joel's out on vacation. I'm so thankful for uh, Daniel. He's just a great blessing in my life. In our church, we love you, brother. We love this band and what you do for us all the time. Let me mention real quickly, this little bulletin you were handed has three purposes, actually. We used to only have two purposes. Now it has three purposes. Number one, it's a, it's a way if you're visiting with us today, I'd love to know that. I'd like to write notes to people and thank them personally for doing that. So if you happen to be visiting with us today and you've never done so before, would you fill that visitor portion of that out? We don't give that information to anyone. I just want to write you a note and thank you personally for being here. There's a place there for prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, we're up to 109 people on our prayer team in our church now. I can get that information to 109 people for you immediately that we can pray with you. If you want to share something private between me and you, if you'll write down private, I'll, I'll lock it at my desk. I, I could show you if you want to go with me after church. We're actually locked those. I don't let anybody see those. I'll be honored to pray with you about those things. On the other side, you'll see if there's any questions you have about anything in our church, how we do what we do, why we do what we do. We have a wonderful website that might answer those questions. But if there's a question you have about specific ministries, if you just check off what you're interested in knowing more about and write your phone number down there, I'll personally call you this week and we'll talk about that. I'll try to answer any question that you have. And obviously, you can come up to me after the service and ask me anything you want to ask as well. I want to make sure you know uh, that's here for you as well. And then we did something a little different. This thing is perforated both ways now. So you can take your outline home with you. And then you can use this portion if you ever just wanted to invite someone to church or tell more about our church and what we do and why we do it. This is just a, a thumbnail, just sketch of what we do as a church. You can use that almost like a track. And so take advantage of those opportunities, if you will. Please read the announcements. There'll be an announcement video in just a moment about things going on. Check with your LifePoint leader, because LifePoint groups are still going on. Our LifePoint group tonight will meet here at the church at 6 o'clock. Hope you can come join us. Uh, we're going to take some time off during the summer, but we're still meeting right now, so I hope you'll come and be a part of that. Lots going on. I'm so thankful that you're here. So glad to have my brother Jerry Stout back. I told him if he missed one more Sunday, I was going to resign as pastor. So he said he said he's fixing to get up and leave. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Let's stand, to, let's stand to pray. We believe in praying first as a church. And obviously, if you don't have one of these bands that you see everyone wearing, we want you to have one. They're free of charge. They're in a little basket over here. Please grab one on your way out and wear it. It reminds us that we pray first. This morning, I was walking around the church praying this morning and thinking about that. Did you know that Satan has a plan for this service today? He really does. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he does. He's kind of a broken record, isn't he? I promise you, if you came here today with a need, he doesn't want that need to be fulfilled. If you came here today looking for something from God, he's going to do everything he can to distract you. And so we pray against that today because greater is he that's in us than he that is in this world. And so would you join me as we ask God to have his way in this place and ask him just to beat Satan away in his, his efforts to defeat whatever God wants to do today. Well, God, we do love you today. That's the easiest thing in the whole world to do because you're so faithful to us, God. We came here today not just to be seen. We didn't come here today because it's the right thing to do. We came here, we wanted to spend time with our Heavenly Father. We wanted to spend some time with you, Father. We want to hear from you we need you so desperately in our lives, God. And every one of us that walked into this place today came in with needs. Some of us need forgiveness, God. Some of us just need to be encouraged. Some need hope. Some need comfort. And the great news is everything that we need, we will find in you. Thank you for being our source for all things, God. And thank you that we can come to a place like this and know the promise of Scripture that says that where you are, Father, we can be with you too where we gather together for your purposes and your name, you promise your presence in this place today. And so, God, we claim that promise today, and we thank you for that promise today. Surely, Father, as sure as we want to see something great happen today, Satan does not want that to happen. And so, Father, we believe with all of our heart, if his demons are here to try to do any bidding, that you can beat them back. Surround this building, God, with angels of mercy and protection, and let everything you want to see done, Father, be done today just because you can. We love you, we adore you, we worship you, and we just can't wait, Father, right now to sing to you. Bless yourself, Father, as you bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's worship together this morning. All right, who's glad to be here this morning? the 
peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Say in the silence, in the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead us through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. See my lighthouse.
But Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory, you deserve the glory.
wherever you've been Come broken hearted, let rescue begin Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal So lay down your burdens Lay down your shame And all who are broken Lift up your face all those who strayed come sit at the table come taste the grace there's rest for the weary rest that endures earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure As the gentleman come to help take up the offering this morning, let me remind you that it's summertime. We look around and we miss our Lee students when they're gone. I miss all those guys when they leave. And having children close to that age, I'm just reminded when they're not here with us. And we know that we're going to be scattered all summer. Let me encourage you to take a vacation. My wife would let you know that I'm not really good at doing that. I, I like what I do. And she reminds me at least once a year that if I want to stay married to my 32nd year, I need to take a vacation. And so take a vacation, but please come back. We miss you when you're gone. Go have a great vacation with your family, and please remain faithful. God's been so good to us. I appreciated Bobby giving us the update on where we are financially, and we're meeting budget, praise God. We want to keep doing that. The summertime can be tough for that, so please remain faithful in your presence and also with your tithe. God, we love you this morning. What an honor to be in your presence. What an honor, Father, to have this opportunity to give back to the one who gives us everything that we have. God, you have been so faithful to us, and we want to be faithful to you. I pray especially for that person in this room this morning, God, that 
that's never learned the joy of giving. We're never more like you than when we give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're never more like you, God, than when we give. And thank you for the promises in your word, Father. When we give, you give back. We're not here, Father, to treat you like a celestial genie. We're not here to say, if we give, then, Father, you have to do something. But, God, we want to be faithful because, God, we know that you're going to be faithful to us. And so bless us as we take up this offering, God. Expand it, multiply it, enable us, God, to help as many people as we possibly can through it. All around this world, God, we want to send these dollars to bless the world. Thank you for what you do for us each and every day. We love you, and we serve you, and we want to give back to you. Bless this offering, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning, church. My name is Angie, and I get to welcome you this morning. We love our members, our visitors, and those joining us through our live stream, and we want to say thank you for your generosity. When you give with your time and money, you become the feet and hands of Jesus to those around our community and to the ends of the world. And if you would like to give through credit or debit card, you can do it at the kiosk at the Info Hub or anytime online at gracepoint.church. Now, there's four things I want to remind you of this week. Number one. Men from our church will be going to the Great Iron Conference June 14th and 15th. And if you would like to come, we ask you to sign up at the bulletin board by the Info Hub. Number two, Servants Heart Jamaica is going to be having their fifth annual indoor yard sale. And that'll be June 15th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now we are accepting donations of all items except for adult clothing. You can bring children's clothing and you can bring adult shoes, but we ask for no adult clothing. If you have anything you would like to donate today, you can bring it to the Info Hub after the service. Number three, our 2019 VBS will be the incredible race and that'll be June 23rd through the 27th. You can already sign up your children online. And if you would like to volunteer, you can do it in the children's wing by talking to Matt or Sonia. Finally, we are collecting toys for the Operation Christmas Child Boxes that we'll be putting together in November. But this month, during the month of May, we ask for you to bring toys. They can be as simple as toys from the dollar store. We do ask that they do not contain liquid, they are not weapons, and they are not military toys. So let's start planning for us to be able to be generous in November for the kids all around the world. Well, amen. Before we get started, I don't want to remind you, we need to pray for someone this morning. I forgot to mention this earlier, John Weiss who, why couldn't he do this when we were having our cornhole tournament? He has a kidney stone this morning. Woo! And everybody that knows, I know I've had the trials and tribulations with that. We need to pray for him for sure. Help us pray about that. And then last night, our family, we had a great day with our family yesterday, just a beautiful day. And my phone rang, and I jumped up and ran. I thought it was one of those telemarketers or some, some number I didn't recognize. And it was Pastor Mindy calling me. I know y'all know I stay in touch with him. And He's in the United States already. He's in Newport, Tennessee, I think, right now. He's going to go in, in the Washington, D.C. area and Virginia. But he'll be with us at the end of next month, so don't forget that. I think the last Sunday of next month he'll be here with us just to give us a report of the work that God's doing. 
in Gambia. And if you've not met Pastor Mindy, you've got to meet him. I think it's been 10 or 12 years now he's come to just spend some time with us. And every year it seems like it comes down 1%, but the Muslim population in their nation keeps, I think 99% the first year he talked to us, and every year say it's 98 or 97. He's making a great dent in a place in the world where it's very, very difficult. And so look forward to seeing him very, very soon. Well, we started a series of messages last week. I think it's important. We're going to go obviously through Mother's Day all the way to Father's Day, talking about the family, the great adventure. Um, I've been a daddy now, I guess, for 27 years, and it has been the great adventure. It really has. Anybody that doesn't know what that feels like has really missed something valuable in life. Being a father, being a mother. I know those in the room, my mother would say this, and my dad used to always say, you don't realize how good it gets. There's a reason they call it great and great, great, great as it goes to grandmother and granddad. It just gets better and better and better. And maybe one day I'll know what that feels like too. But the point is, it's a great adventure, this thing called family. It's something that God created. I'm, I'm really glad God created the family. There's so many things that he created, it seems like, in this world that are very, very important. Last week, we started this series of messages by talking about mothers and how important the role that a mother has in this world. It's a unique role that no one else has. And I know every mother wants to be a great blessing in that role. And we spent some time talking about what that looks like from that valuable passage of Scripture out of Proverbs 31. And today, we'll go in our second of these particular messages and talk about the subject of marriage. I want to talk about marriage today because it seems like we're living in a day and time when anything that is sacred, anything that is, is Christian in this world today is completely under attack. I want to stop for just a second and, and get on a little bit of a soapbox and say there's something really wrong in a world to where there can be laws passed in places like New York City that say it's okay to kill a baby all the way up to the time when they could be born to having people criticize having any laws that would prohibit that, yet the same people over here that would say you can't kill a spotted owl or a snail darter or perhaps a bald eagle, they want to put you in jail for doing that, but if you kill children, that's completely okay. How many people know how messed up that really is? Did you know that in the United States of America today, somewhere between three to 4,000 babies are literally thrown in dumpsters, and there are three to 4,000 people that would be honored to have those babies and raise them? I know couples that have spent $100,000 to adopt a baby, and yet they throw them in the garbage can as though they have no meaning in this world. There's something messed up in a society when anything it seems that it's Christian is completely under attack and it's okay. Yet you never hear them criticize Muslims or anyone else in this world. It seems to be only the Christians that seem to be the ones that are made fun of. If you watched a sitcom lately and seen how the Christians always made out to be the person who has lost their marbles or is completely out of touch with the reality, when in reality that's the opposite of the truth. There's no place that I've seen in my lifetime more under attack than it comes to redefining what a family is and what a marriage is. And I want to come back where I started and say this. You need to know this. God created marriage and God created the family. And no one, no government laws, no government officials have the right to redefine what God has defined. What God has put in place, man should never argue with or try to replace. Do you understand that? If God put it in place, we should never try to replace it. And I would say as our world has tried to do that over the times that I've been alive, our world has not become a better place, but a worse place. Can I ask you this? Is America a stronger nation today that half the children in America don't have a father and a mother in their home? Absolutely not. It's worse. Economically, morally, every way you can imagine, it's amazing. We'll talk more about that next week when we talk about family. But specifically today, I want to talk about the importance of marriage, an institution that God created that no one has the right to redefine. So let's talk about marriage a little bit. The first thing I would like to do is give you a ready definition. This is my definition. It's nothing special, but it's my definition of what I think a marriage is. A marriage is a covenant. It's a sacred bond between one man, one woman for one lifetime. I know that sounds awkward, but it's God's plan for one man to marry one woman for one lifetime. Marriage is instituted by God and is entered into, into a public ceremony before God. 31 years ago, almost really close to 31 years ago, I stood at an altar and said some vows in front of a lot of people at Central Baptist Church in Hickson, Tennessee. But I was not pronouncing those vows to my wife or to all those who were assembled there. I was saying those words to God. I made a covenant with God, not just with my bride and not just with the people that were listening, especially speaking to God. I made a covenant in a marriage. That's what a marriage is. It's a public ceremony, but it's really in front of
I tell every couple, you know, when I sign, I have the right because of my license and because I'm ordained in the state of Tennessee, I could literally sign someone's marriage license, not even have a ceremony, they'd be married. According to the laws of man, they'd be married. I always tell them when I sign that right before the ceremony, I said, okay, we've taken care of man, now the rest is for God. Marriage is created by God, designed by God. And today I want to talk to you about God's divine design for marriage. It's a covenant relationship between one man, one woman for one lifetime that's established in a ceremony that is public before God. And Christian marriage, as I said earlier, is under attack like never before in our nation. Let me share some things from God's Word real quickly. Write these down. I didn't give you a place uh, fill in the blank for this, but write these things down. There are five principles that really make up what a marriage actually is. Number one, marriage is to be permanent. I know it sounds odd, but God intended for people to marry one person and stay married to that person for a whole lifetime. It's to be permanent. God's Word tells us this in Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. God intends for marriage to be a permanent relationship. Number two, he intends it to be sacred. Marriage is sacred. God's word tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, the Lord God fashioned a woman from a rib taken out of man and brought her to the man. The Bible says that God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. So what did he do? He designed a helper for him to come. He created that person literally from the man. God brought her. And I've told you this, and I need to share it. I think that the first time that Adam saw Eve, saw Eve this is what he said. Wow! I think that's what he said. That's what I said the first time I saw my bride. Wow! And so, it's to be sacred. God designed marriage. He created a helper for man. That's the first marriage that ever took place. It's to be sacred. Number three, it's to be intimate. Listen to these words out of Genesis 2, verses 23 and 24. And the man said, it is now, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God intends for marriage to be intimate. Number four, it involves submission. It involves submission. Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19 says this, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against her. You cannot even discuss the subject of marriage without talking about submission. It is not just one-sided. It is submitting one to another. The only way a marriage will ever last a lifetime if there's mutual submission. And then finally, the fifth thing I would say to you about marriage is it's to be exclusive. It's intended to be exclusive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 2, God's word tells us this. Because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own wife husband. It's God's intention that one man marry one woman and live one lifetime committed totally to one another and never to go stray from that relationship. That has never been God's intention. It never will be. It is to be exclusive. So let's talk about two things real quickly and we'll be done this morning. Let's first talk about the wife. According to God's word in this text, I want you to look at this morning with me in Ephesians chapter 5. You need to know this. First of all, the wife shows loyalty which is revealed in surrender. Write that in your notes. It is loyalty revealed in surrender. If you'll go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, you'll read these words. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. As I said a moment ago, you can't even discuss the Christian life without talking about submission. We are saved when we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way a marriage makes it, again, is mutual submission. But he first starts talking here about submission of the wife. There's two words that you can't talk about marriage without talking about. Those two words, in my opinion, would be submission or surrender and love. Those are two things. Here's the two key components to make a marriage work. Dumbing it down as far as we can here, guys. Surrender and submission to one another and true, genuine love is what makes a marriage work. That's the fuel that they run on. So let's talk about that as it applies to the wife. 
put down first of all, notice the exhortation. The exhortation. Verse 22 is not a suggestion. It's actually a command. It says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. The words there, be subject, which is interesting in the Bible, actually refers to a previous verse, which is verse 21. Look what it says there. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. As I mentioned a moment ago, this is mutual submission, but right now he's king on the one side of that, which is for the wife. This word, be subject, literally means willing to submit or voluntary submission. But I want you to notice that this is not just a, a voluntary submission to nothing. There's actually a motive that's included in the verse. Look at it again. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. There's your motive. As much as it may be great for someone just out of a sense of doing the right thing to submit to their husband, he doesn't want you to do that. What he wants you to do is to submit to your husband, wives, as you do to the Lord. It's an interesting thing. We're going to come in a minute and talk about the guys. So ladies, please don't get upset with me because we're going to beat them up in just a minute. But right now we're talking about the wives. Wives, if you would submit yourself to your husband as unto the Lord. That's what he says. It's actually qualified. There's a motive behind it. There's a reason behind it as to the Lord. That's an exhortation from God. It's a command from God. Number two, notice the example. He gives us an example in verse 23. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being Savior of the body. There's one thing you learn about God when you read the Word of God, and I hope every person in this room reads the Word of God every single day of your life. God has made that so convenient and so easy. You can download an app on your phone called YouVersion, and it'll read to you every day. It can't get easier than that. Every one of you need to be in the Word of God every single day of your life. It will never hurt you to read the Word of God. And the more you read the Word of God, both Old and New Testament, you'll find out something interesting about God. God is very much a God of order. He's very orderly. I bought something for my swimming pool last week from a gentleman who posted something on Craigslist, a, a cover for our pool. He lives less than a mile from my house. And when I went over to his house, he said, well, come out here to the garage. I have it in the garage. I've never seen a garage like this. I literally would eat my meal. Y'all know I'm a germ freak. I would eat my meal off the floor of his garage. He had, a, he had a, a, an antique old VW Bug, a 74 model, I think, in mint condition right next to a VW bus that was, I don't remember how, I think maybe 69 mile or something like that next to it. Mint, I would eat off of those, engine or anything. Everything in there was, I mean, labeled and boxed and put on there. There's nothing that wasn't where it's supposed to be. I ask him, do you have any time in your life to do any? I mean, this is ridiculous. I believe in order, but this is crazy, right? God is an orderly God. Number one, he's God, and he's really good at being God. And as he pronounces the things he believes are important, he does it with great order. Now, go back to this verse with that thought in mind. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being Savior of the body. I don't know why God chose to do things the way he did, but I do believe that's a timeless word. I don't think that's something that was just because of that day and time. I believe God pronounced something that works. It's amazing when we do things the way God tells us to do them, how well they work. It's amazing how obedience works and disobedience does not work. And doing the things that God tells us to do the way God tells us to do them will always succeed and it will always work. Listen to these words. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, it says, But I want you to understand that Christ is head over every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is head of Christ. I almost see that stuff on that guy's shelf ordered and labeled, right? Here's the way it works. And I promise you, trying to do it another way will never succeed. God has given us a timeless word on how this works. And so he gives the ultimate example. Number three, write this down. Notice the expectation. God's expectation is given in verse 24. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. When we do things the way God orders them, it works amazingly well. Look at this verse one more time. But as the church is subject to Christ... So also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. 
So the whole point I'll make to you is this loyalty is demonstrated by the wife in the way that she submits, in the way she surrenders. That's what God tells us. There's something orderly about that. There's something important about that. So let me move on to help the ladies understand something about why this works. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the husband. The husband has a really important role here as well. Husbands is love revealed in sacrifice. Write that down. It's love revealed in sacrifice. Underneath that, write this down. Number one, the command. The command. In verse 25, look at the first part of the verse. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. What a command. This is not a suggestion. It's a command. So before you think, woe is me, I'm a lady, listen to me. A man has this responsibility. I am to love my wife the way that God loves the church. What a command. How does God love the church? He is willing to do whatever it takes to demonstrate his love to his church, all the way to the point of giving his own life for his church. He demonstrates his own love toward us that while we're yet sinners, Christ was willing to die for us. And every time I do pre premarital counseling, and I've married hundreds of couples over the years, I always talk about this. I believe that women today would stand around the block in a line to find a man that would love them the way that Christ loves the church. Problem is, those guys are hard to find, and don't say amen, ladies. I believe women will stand in a long line around the block to find a man that would love them the way that Christ loves the church. I can't imagine a marriage ever getting off into the weeds in any way when the man would really demonstrate this kind of love to his wife. When a woman knows that she is loved in that way, with that kind of sacrificial love, that agape love that God gives to you and to me through his son Jesus, how in the world could it ever be derailed? And so the key component here is not for some man to stand up and look at his wife and say, you need to submit, woman, look what the Bible says. Well, the next time your husband says it to you, well, he says, well, you ought to love me the way that Christ loves the church. Here's what I'll say, ladies. If you'll do what God tells you to do, maybe that man will be softened and maybe he'll do what he needs to do. Let the Holy Spirit lead him, and it's okay to kick him every now and remind him. But listen to me, gentlemen, if you will love your wife the way that Christ loves the church, you'll have no problems with your wife. I know I'm picking on things. I've never, I've never called Jordan's name for the pulpit. I'll, I'll never forget when Jordan came to see me for the very first time. He was actually to see Bethany, but I was there. And he rode up on a Harley Davidson. I knew immediately we'd be friends. I did my typical role. I showed him my guns, and he went out to his saddlebag to show me his gun. Then I knew we'd be close friends. <laughs> and I'll never forget this, Jordan, the rest of my life. When you came and sat on the couch next to me one day, I got in my space. I mean, he got in my... Y'all you know what I'm talking about? Way too close for somebody to know that well. And he said, sir, I need to know something. Are you okay with me dating your daughter? It's an honorable thing to do, Jordan. And he'll probably never forget the words I said at that moment, which were these, if I remember correctly. You know I love my daughter Bethany, and I would do anything to protect her. I'd kill someone that tried to hurt her. As long as you keep Jesus in the center of your relationship, I'll never have a problem with you. And he said to me, sir, you will never have a problem with me. What an honorable thing. And thank you for taking care of my daughter. You've done a beautiful job of doing that. That's what it's supposed to be about. And I will say to Jordan and Nick and every other man in this room, if you would spend your time and energy loving your wife the way that Christ loves the church, you won't have any problems out of your wife, I promise you. The problem is, are we really doing that? Are they a leftover in our life? Are we really paying attention to them? And every one of us, starting with this preacher, I promise you, can do better at this. But here's the standard for you and me. Here's the command from God. Not a suggestion. It's a command from God. You want to have a, a fruitful marriage? Get busy loving your wife the way Christ loves the church. You'll have no problems. Number two, he gives the clarification. He doesn't want to just leave you hanging with that. He's going to give you some more information. Just in case you don't get this, love your wife the way that I love the church. And if you don't get that, let me give you some further evidence. Number one, write this down, the A there. Love that sacrifices the second part of that verse, let me read the whole 25th verse. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Just in case you don't know how he loves you, he was willing to give everything he has for you. Everything. 
Has anyone ever brought some? We used to have some friends that would bring us special things. I, I won't call names, but there was one particular friend we had in the church used to make pound cake. Can I get an amen for a home-baked, still warm, come on now, really know what they're doing, pound cake? Not this stuff you buy at Publix or something. I'm talking about out of the oven, still hot when they bring it to our house. And when she would bring that to our house, I'll be honest with you, I would take it and I would hide it in my room. I would not put it anywhere near the kitchen. Because if you've ever been in the Griffin household, there's people in and out of my house all the time. And I'm being completely honest. I, didn't, I was, get all the little Debbies you want to out of my pantry, get anything out, but you can't have the pound cake. It's my pound cake, right? I might slither a little piece off for my kids. Maybe this is a little thin piece, you know. You can see through it probably. I'd get me a Whopper like that with a bowl of ice cream. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Everybody's getting hungry now. I would hide that from public consumption because I liked it so much. I want you to think about this. When God wanted to demonstrate his love for you, he got the best he had to show it. He could have sent an angel to get on that cross, couldn't he? He could have done all kinds of amazing things to show his love for you, but he got the most special thing he had and sent him to this world to be crucified for you and for me. That's an unbelievable demonstration of love. And so he says here, if you want to know what it really looks like to love your wife the way that I love the church, it will involve sacrifice, agape love. This is, listen, this is a spontaneous love. It's a love that never says because, it says regardless of. What an amazing love he has for you and me. It's a love that sacrifices, number two, the be there. Love that transforms. Always kind of confused by these words. Look at verse 26. So that he might sanctify her. He's talking here about, again, the church. Having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. I believe it speaks to salvation. Verse 27. That he might present himself the church in all her glory. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But she would be holy and blameless. Listen to me. The only way that you and I could ever be holy and blameless is a, a thing called sanctification. It is God's work in our lives. It is making us as though we have never sinned. That is a work of God demonstrated on the cross, a bought thing for, because of his grace and mercy for you and me. The reason he sacrificed his life for us is to make us pure, to make us as though we had never sinned. Verse 28. So, talking now about marriage again. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Verse 29, but no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Finally, verse 30, because we are members of his body. Someone said it this way, Jesus' love for us always wants what's best for us. Now stay with me for a minute. Jesus' love for us always wants what's best for us. Maybe this is something for everybody in this room to hear real quickly. God's thoughts for you, his desires for you, his work in you is always for your best. There's never a time God's trying to trip you up or manipulate you. Everything he wants done in your life and for you, his sacrifice on the cross was what was, was for best for you. Now take that thought. Gentlemen, every thought you have, every deed you do every day for your wife ought to be for the very best for her. Think about that. I mean, it's simple things. A, a fleshly way to say that, I would make sure that all of my daughters and my wife have a car that I think will get them where they're going, and I will walk before I will get, give them a clunker to drive, right? I drive the clunker in our family. My car has 300,000 miles on it, and it's a 2002 Forerunner. It runs like a top. It's a great little car. But I'm not going to put them. I'm going to put them in something the best I can afford to make sure, they, you know, because I want what's best for them, spiritually speaking, physically speaking, in every way I want what's best for my family. Don't you? When I pray every day of my life for my family, don't you pray for your family for God's best for them, for the best comfort, for the best encouragement, for the best every, I want the best for them. If I never get a present for my birthday or for Christmas ever again in my life, I don't need anything anyway. I want what's best for them. And the day that I die on this earth, whether it be tomorrow or 10 years from now or 50 years from now, I want what's best for them. I want to do the very best I can for them. You know why? Because I love them. God loves you. He demonstrates his love for you. He wants what's best for you. 
And so when he talks about presenting his church spotless, he wants the best for you. And we men, we ought to want the very best for our wives, the very best for our families. That's what marriage is all about. I've often said the greatest thing you'll ever do for your children is to love your wives, gentlemen. It's the best thing you'll ever do. We had one of those days yesterday that's rare for our family. I wish it was more often that all of us, everybody, was all around the table eating. Everybody was hanging out the house. Everybody having a big time. And I bumped into Tracy two or three times yesterday, and I, I was just sharing with her my thoughts, which were these. How blessed are we? How blessed are we? If all we have is each other, if all you have are each other, how blessed are you? Gentlemen, pay attention. Love your wife the way he loves you. Love your wife the way that he loves the church. If you will sacrifice for her, if you'll be willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that the best happens for her, you'll have no problems with your wife, I promise you. The last thing here, the C, is love that unites. It unifies, excuse me. It unifies. These final two verses, two or three verses, listen to verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Just a parenthesis here for those who happen to be in the same place that me and Tracy are with young marriage and whatever. One of the greatest mistakes that many parents make is they stick their nose in their children's business. I hope we never do that with you guys. But it's our desire not to do that. We want to be there available. We want to answer any questions. We want to help any way we can, but we don't want to be nosy about that. I praise God that my parents never nosed into our business. Just do what God tells you to do, Phil. Encourage us in that. I, as parents, we need to do that in every way. And so when you, when you go back to this text again, it says again, For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When you, when you get married, you need to go. It doesn't mean physically necessarily you have to go way away. The point is you have a family now. Too many men in this room, especially young men, think that I can go get married to my bride and still keep all my buddies and come home from working all day and change clothes and go hang out with my buddies working on cars or going bowling and forget about my wife. And Tracy would give witness of the many couples we've counseled over the years where people just feel like they, they can just live the old life they have and still keep a marriage together. It almost never works out. Your priority starting right now, gentlemen, when you get married, is your bride above everything else. Your own mother doesn't have the right to discourage your bride. She needs to feel protected in every way. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It's a hard thing to do. And the onus many times is on us as parents to keep that in the right place. Verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Finally, verse 33, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. I wrote this in my notes. When a husband truly loves his wife with sacrificial love, with a transforming love, the ultimate result will be a unifying love. Forget everything I said about the ladies just a moment ago. Gentlemen, just for a minute, listen to me. If you would make your eyes single today to love your wife with a sacrificial love, with a love that demonstrates your love for her and doesn't talk about the love, and I'm not talking about bringing roses home every day. I'm talking about living your life sacrificially for your bride, what, what's best for your bride. If you would do that, if you would live in such a way as to want the very best for her, it will unify your marriage. You'll have one of those long marriages. I got some great stakes. I want to be the next one that says 60. Ted back here, I think, getting close to 60 years. I want to be that guy, and I know you do too. The way that happens is, men, you sacrifice for your wife. You demonstrate your love for her. Know that she, know that she needs to know that she's the priority of your life. It'll bring unity in your life. Write two things down. The fruit of this type of love will bring two things. Number one, genuine commitment. Genuine commitment. In verse 31, it says this, For this reason a man shall leave his father, mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is a genuine commitment. I know I've said this a thousand times to you, but I literally said this to my wife. If you ever leave me, don't stop on your way out the door because I'm going to bump into you. I've made a commitment. If I have to chase her down, so be it. I'll chase her down. I made a commitment. I hope you've made a commitment, gentlemen. 
I leave my father and mother and I do what? I cleave to my wife. That's genuine commitment. And if we can put it the other way, ladies, the same on your, you need to cleave to your husband. It should unify you in an amazing way for an extra long relationship that's eternal. Genuine commitment. Number two, genuine respect. Nevertheless, verse 33, each individual among you is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Now, true and true respect and true success in life is to be loved and respected by the people that know you best. I've talked to you about this. It doesn't matter if the whole world thinks you're the greatest man that ever lived. If your own wife doesn't feel that way, then you're a total failure. If every person in the church, all the teenagers in the church think you're the awesomest guy there ever was. Is that a word, awesomeness? Awesomest? I don't know if that's even a word, but I just made it up and it's a word now. If every teenager in the church thinks you're the most incredible guy in the church and your own teenagers can't stand your guts, you're a total, utter failure. There's nothing wrong with having everybody in the church think you're a great guy, but if your own family doesn't feel that way, you've missed something. True success as a father and as a mother is to be loved and respected by the ones who know you best, the ones who live under the same roof with you, the ones who do life with you. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And so let's wrap this up in a big bow. Ladies, if you would submit to your husband, I'm not talking about a blind submission. I know that every man's not worth submitting to, but if you would submit to your husband and pray for him, and gentlemen, if you would begin to love your wife the way that God demonstrates his love to the church and want what's best for her, and show that to her, not just tell her that, don't just tell her, you know, hey, I love you, and if I change my mind, I'll tell you. That doesn't work. You must demonstrate your love for her. If you would get busy doing that, you will find unity will happen in your marriage. And before you know it, you'll be the next couple that says, it's our 60th, our 65th, maybe 70th. Who, I'm, who knows how long you live? Anniversary. Marriage is under assault in America today. Now, it's going to hurt somebody's feelings in a room, but let your feelings be hurt. God designed marriage. He has a grand design for marriage. It does not include two men getting married and two women getting married. I'm sorry. Make all the laws you want to as a nation. That is not marriage. Call it whatever you want to call it. If someone wants to go do that, that's their business. But don't try to replace what God has put in place. God created marriage. Marriage is one woman marrying one woman for one lifetime. That's God's ultimate goal. What did I say? At least somebody's listening, right? <laughs> Let me take those words back. <laughs> one man marrying one woman for one lifetime. Praise God. <laughs> Quit laughing at the preacher. hurt my feelings. No, I'm just kidding. It's all good. I'm so glad y'all were paying attention. Everybody needs a good laugh. Are you with me here? I don't care what they say in Washington, D.C. I don't care how they protest on the curb out here saying that it should be changed. There's going to be days they may be po Walk around our building while we're worshiping. Let it be. But God's word has settled this issue. God created marriage. It's one man, one woman, one lifetime. I know there are people in this room that's not worked out so much for you. You know what? I want to make sure I say this before we leave. We're not going backwards. We're going forwards. So wherever you are today, let's start afresh and new today. Last time I checked, God's a great God of forgiveness. And if you've made some mistakes in your past, put them in the past. But as you go forward, if God allows you maybe later to marry someone else, make it your goal to honor God. And if you will do that, I promise you, I promise you, if you'll do it God's way, it will always work. Praise God that he created marriage. He defined what it is. And if we have to, we'll protest and say, this is the way it must be. God has a divine desire and design for marriage. One man, one woman, one lifetime. God, we love you. I'm so thankful today, God, that we could take the time to look into your word and be reminded that you created marriage. And God, what you have put in place, no man has the right to replace. And so God, we, we believe your word to be true. We believe, Father, your ways work. And so, God, I pray for every man and every woman in this room 
that is married. I would even go as far as to pray for those that may be engaged or close to engagement or one day hope to be married, that they would understand that your ways actually work. That God, you're a God of order. That every woman needs to submit to a husband. But I know that husband, Father, needs to be worth submitting to. And so help us, Lord, as men and women to do it your way. I pray for every man in this room, God, that they would get busy loving their wives the way that you love the church. That God, if they saw a husband that was willing to sacrifice for them and always want what's best for them, surely, God, they'd have a unified marriage. I pray that we would take our responsibilities seriously. And God, the whole world may say this is the wrong way, but your word says it's the right way. So God, we will not attempt to replace what you've put in place. Lord, I pray for marriages in this room this morning. I know, Father, there are marriages in this room. If we could see you can see them, we would know, God, that there's some troubled marriages. God, there's probably some marriages in this room really close to divorce. Lord, there's some couples in this room that have a smile on their face, but when there's no one looking and there's no one around, God, there's no love there at all. Lord, I pray for a resurrection of agape love one for another. I pray for men to love their wives the way that you command them to love them. I pray for wives to submit and encourage their husbands the way they're commanded to. I pray, Father, for Satan to leave these marriages alone. Too many of us have given footholds in our marriages, God, for Satan to do his bidding, to, to devour us, God, to separate us. I pray, Father, against that. I don't know what needs to happen this morning. I just know this, God. Without you, we have no hope. You're here today, and you don't know Christ is your Savior. Let me share this with you real quickly. Jesus loved you so much that he came to this earth, and he lived for 33 years. He lived 33 sinless years, had a three-year ministry that still impacts the world to this day. Jesus, as was predicted over 800 years before he would ever be born, was born of a virgin in a little place called Bethlehem. He lived these 33 sinless years, and he died on a cross for you and for me. The Bible said that three days later he'd be resurrected, and the Bible records that 500 people saw Jesus three days after he had been been killed. It is an absolute fact that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. And he did that for you, and he did that for me. The Bible makes it abundantly clear. If we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did what he said he would do, that we can be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you would repent of your sin and throw yourself on his mercy, ask for his forgiveness, Jesus will save your soul. I promise you he will. Far too many of us in this room, we know Christ, but we also know that life is busy and, and we've gotten out of kilter and we're not doing the things we need to do to make our marriages as strong as they could be. So God, I pray for the marriages in this room, for men and women to recommit themselves today, to be the husband and the wife they know they're commanded to be. Strengthen our marriages, God. Make them an example for the whole world to see. Show us afresh and new that your ways really do work, God. They always have and they always will. We love you. We want what's best for our marriages. We want what's best for the kingdom. And so help us in this moment, I pray. Whatever God's put on your heart to do, you do that this morning. Hey, I wanted to thank you for tuning into our live stream today. It absolutely means the world to us that you would do that. We know that your time is valuable and that you would give it to us means the world to us. We love to hear feedback from people that listen to our broadcast. And so if you've, you've been blessed by this in any way, please get in touch with us. You can do that in several different ways. Our phone number is 423 423- 728-5050. If you'd like to reach out through email, you can obviously do that. And we'd love to hear from you, obviously, through any social media. If you want to get on our web, web page, you can find out more about our church through there. You'll find out everything about what we do, when we do it, and why we do it there. That's gracepoint.church. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for taking time to watch today. Let me leave you with this word. In Psalm 119, 105, it says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I pray that these services that you're watching are helping you through God's word to light the path. Look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.